took this picture. I wish it was me, but but I just used it now. But anyways, it's nice. Uh, yeah, it does. Okay, so we know this is the week of Thanksgiving, and um, so we want to touch talk about you know Thanksgiving unto the Lord. And uh, Nancy, you know, after after service, we all have a, a, a lunch, so everyone's invited to stay with us, so we can talk about you know whatever issues we may have. We always like to talk about them in in, in lunch. So it's all vegetarian, so and everybody's welcome to stay. But today, we want to talk about, you know, Thanksgiving, you know, being thankful unto the Lord. You know, we read, we love to contemplate the character and love of God in his created works, don't we? Just like that picture, right? That picture was beautiful. What evidence, evidences has he given the children of men of his power, as well as his parental love? He has garnished the heavens and made grand the beautiful the earth. You ever go outside and, 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 uh, and just look around, and especially at night, and just be thankful, you know, of what God has made and given to us? I mean, right now, this is the time that, that we take for Thanksgiving as a celebration. But I want to read this in Psalms. It says, Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, because thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, the question is, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Have you ever stopped to wonder? As an individual, you, us, why God is mindful of you or me as an individual? You ever stop to think the special relationship that the creator of all these things that he created them and made everything wonderful and beautiful just for you? Not as a general, but just for you as an individual? That you can wake up in the morning, go outside and see the stars. If you get up as early as Tony and I do, you get up in the morning and it's black out there for a few hours. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. All these things he made for you and I. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fall of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the pass of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know? I want to read something to you. The mind fixed on Christ. He that walketh upright walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Isn't that the truth? Right? The very first step in the path of life is to keep the mind stayed on God, to have his fear continually before the eyes, a single departure from a moral integrity blunts the conscience and opens the door to the next temptation. You ever think about that? What is man? What are you? Let me ask that question. What are you and I? You see this body that God formed from the dust of the ground with his bare hands? He formed the body, right? And as he was done, he picked that body up and he breathed into the nostrils the breath of air, right? Breath of life. And then man became a living soul. But what is man? What are you? When someone passes, we had a um, memorial service this past Sunday here. And um, the question always arises, what is it that we're going to miss from when someone passes? 
Which also brings the question, is what is man? You are thoughts. That's all we are. We are thoughts and feelings. This vessel here that God created was made to house our thoughts and our feelings. But in this body, he also created a special place for who? For himself through the Holy Spirit. So when he, you have this reading, a single departure from moral integrity blunts the conscience and opens the door to the next temptation. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his way shall be known, are commanded to give God supremely, to love God supremely, and our neighbor as ourselves. But the daily experience of life shows that this law is disregarded. This has been the norm lately. Uprightness in deal and moral integrity will secure the favor of God and make a man a blessing to himself and to society. But amid the very temptations that assail one, whichever may he turn, it is impossible to keep a clear conscience and the approval of heaven without the divine aid and a principle to love honestly for the sake of the right. So this vessel that has been created, once we have a, a perverted or a uh, departure from our moral integrity, what happens to the thoughts, the pattern for the rest of the day? It could happen. We start thinking this weird and we start, it starts affecting ourselves. You know, I tell you this all the time, whenever I get a chance to, see, to be in the morning, as you are in your workplace and you start to watch the people come in, you know, some have happy faces, some are not happy. Some say good morning, some just walk through, don't even acknowledge you, you know. Which person are you? Which, who are you in the morning, you know? Do you get on your knees in the morning and say, thank you, oh Lord. Today is going to be a great day. Today is going to be good. So what should we be thankful for? today and this season first and most of all that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life can you believe that the creator of all this gave his son so that you and I can have life because without that what would be we be today, or would we even exist? We'd be running around barefoot, like everybody does. Right? In the matchless gift of his son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-given atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Jesus Christ. Do you know what makes a person um, great? It's not his looks, his appearance, what he does for a living. But what makes a person great and beautiful is what's inside. Is what's inside. And when you hear this person speak, you know this morning I was showing Lucy a little clip of an old awards that was given to, uh, let me see if you remember this. According to television, who was your greatest neighbor? Greatest your greatest neighbor? Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 and, and I say that because he, he was recognized by the world in television as the greatest neighbor that ever was. Do you ever hear him talk? how he presents himself, and he always has something positive to say. What comes out of his mouth has always been good and the caring for others. And you know what? He never, never was ashamed <clears throat> to bless you, but using the name of the Lord. He never denied his Lord. When men women can move fully, more fully comprehend the magnitude of his great sacrifice, 
speaking of our Lord Jesus, which was made by the majesty of heaven and dying in man's stead, then will the plan of salvation be magnified and reflections of Calvary will, be, will awaken tender, sacred, and lively emotions in the Christian's heart. Praises to God and to the Lamb will be in their hearts and upon their lips. Pride and self-esteem cannot flourish in the hearts that keep fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. This world will appear but of little value to those who appreciate the great price of man's redemption, the precious blood of God's dear Son. All the riches of the world are not sufficient value to redeem one perishing soul. Who can measure the love of Christ felt for a lost world as he hung upon the cross, suffering for the sins of guilty men? This love was immeasurable, infinite. Last night, Lucy was reading to me a book I was telling, sharing this morning uh, from HMS Richards. And the book is titled What Jesus Said, printed in 1957. You know what? After reading this book, I recommend, if you want to read a great book, this book is, this book is it. In this book, he says, When our Savior returned to heaven, His presence through the Holy Spirit was still with His disciples on earth. Of the, of the, <laughs> of the coming Spirit, He said, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you. And what did he say? And he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, he said. Thus Christ is present by the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. The world cannot receive him, because the world deals with the tangible and the visible. But the real presence of the Holy Spirit is with the believing disciples. So, not only did God form the world beautiful, and we should be thankful for what He gave us, but because of sin, when man has fallen, God gave us again another gift. He gave us His Son so that He can die in our behalf for our sins. And we as a world should be thankful for that. Amen? But after that, even though when he hung on the cross and he went back to his father's home in heaven, again, he gave us another gift. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. May I ask you a question? Again, what is man? We are thoughts and feelings. So, when a father has a son, and then the son goes, you know what, you're just like your dad. You ever hear that? <laughs> you're just like your dad, or a daughter. You're just, you remind me of your dad, or you remind me of your mom. Why? Because they reflect the father's image, right? They think they have the same thoughts, so you know, what is your spirit? Your spirit is transferred to who? To your children, is it not? So, if God had not given us his Holy Spirit to dwell with us, can you imagine this kind of spirit man would be? Right? You just look around. Let me give you some present truth. Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was it this diligent study so important as it is today, right? Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. You know, children, youth of today, I, I really, really, you really need more, more caution. You need more guarding. You need today even more to get into the Word of God because what you are being bombarded today with the mindset and the generations and all this liberal thinking and ideology is destroying the minds of the children. You have been, you are, you are living in a generation, and I'm going to say it's not worse than Sodom and Gomorrah today. 
because you are being molded today with everything that pops up on your phone, everything that pops up on the TV screen, everything you hear on the radio, everything that the leaders in the world and the artists and the idols and the people who are worship, they are talking and as we're constantly feeding and hearing, we are being molded and we are their spirit, their ideology, their thoughts, their feelings are being, we are being bombarded with that every single day and hour. Is it any wonder why the world is the way it is today? Never before were young men and women confronted by peril so great as confront them today. You know, our human nature, according to Timothy, like you said, know this also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, brow, proud, blasphemers. Diso we hear this all the time, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors. This is, our, this is what we are. Everything you see on the screen, this is what we are without the Spirit of God in our hearts. For of this sort are they which keep, creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. This is the generation of today. How necessary that all who do fear God and love His law should humble themselves before Him and be afflicted and mourn and confess the sins that have separated God from his people. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, he would walk with them in the midst of the garden. But when they sinned, that no longer happened. And as sin progressed, and as sin progressed, the divide between God and man has become so widened. How do you think it is today? How do you think it is today? That which should excite the greatest alarm is that we do not feel or understand our condition, our low estate, and that we are satisfied to remain as we are. Are you satisfied the way we are? Do you, we honestly look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I'm content? Or do we honestly look at ourselves and say, you know what? If Christ was to come right now, I'm ready. We should flee the word of we should flee to the word of God and to prayer individually seeking the Lord earnestly that we may find him. We should make this our first business. So when your eyes wake up in the morning, when you open your eyes, first thing, you know, the moment you open up your eyes, you know, your, your conscience. It's like coming out, you know, like your conscience. What's your very first thought that comes to your mind? I know, do I have to get up this early? Do I really have to go to work? <laughs> but it should be thankful that you were able to get up in the morning. Amen. First Peter, we read, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. What does that mean? But let it be hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Is this what we have? Do we have a meek and quiet spirit? Do we know what that even means? You know, when a lot, a lot of times when you're talking with someone, some of us love to talk, but sometimes if you ever just want to just be quiet and meek and let the other person talk, you will learn a lot you will learn that maybe they are in pain. You may learn that they are hungry. You may learn, and I'm saying this because there's someone at work that I stopped and listened to. You may learn that he's almost about to lose his house. You may learn that his children don't have clothes for coming to school. You may learn if it's a girl or a boy that this person may, is may being abused by somebody. Or you may just learn that this person needs your prayer and your friendship. Or just someone to be a listener. 
This is what a meek and quiet spirit can do. You can learn and you can help your fellow man. In Hebrews we read, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is quick. You know, the word of God, when you read it, will show you how you differ from, from God. In Luke we read, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Do I have to tell you what's inside a person's heart when you hear a person? What do we say when you hear a person always talking negative? Or you hear a person always talking the way they do? Man, that guy, that guy really needs a new heart, doesn't he? You ever have those? Uh, like, you know, I have a friend, and we've been friends for a long time. We used to work at another company. For years, he always calls me, he calls me, you know? But I'm always doing all the listening, and I don't mind. Sometimes when I'm busy, I'll, I'll say, okay, right now I don't have time. But, but when he calls me, he always calls me just to, to unvent. And then yesterday, he just called me. He called me yesterday, so okay, I answered the phone. And he just called me and said, Abraham, I'm, you know, I'm not having a bad day. You know what? He just says, um, you pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Okay. And that was it. Okay, I'll call you back later. And I said, wow. For someone to reach out and call someone who I haven't seen him in years, but just phone to say, you pray for me and I'll pray for you. I mean, I, I was humbled. You know what I mean? I was humbled. But sometimes <laughs> that means a lot to a person. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man which is in him. What is your spirit? Your thoughts and your feelings. That's who and what you are. You are what you are, what you think, and you are what you say. Because what you say and what you think is what you do. That is your spirit. So when we pray for the Holy Spirit to come into us, what are we praying for? We're praying for the mind of Christ. We're praying for His thoughts. We're praying for His feelings to come into us to remove the thoughts and feelings that we have so that we can reflect who? Christ. That's... Let me read it again. For what man knoweth the things of a man? You know what you are. I know what I am. Save the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God knows what you are. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the world is bombarding us every single day. But the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You don't think that God wants to give us his thoughts and his feelings at the moment we get on our knees and ask for them? He does. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Lucy read that to me last night. Any one act, either good or evil, does not form the character, but thoughts and feelings indulge, prepare the way for acts and deeds of the same kind. It is by a reputation of acts that habits are established and character is confirmed. In Acts we read, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Don't give way to fretful, unkind feelings, but remember that the Lord reads even the thoughts of the heart and nothing is concealed from his all-seeing eye. Right acts, right thoughts will be remembered in heaven. And every victory you gain when tempted to do wrong, every temptation manfully resisted 
will be recorded in heaven. That's something that we seem to forget in this generation. See, lately, when I remember growing up as a kid, one of the things that, that we were kids, they would always tell us, God is watching you, God is watching you. You know, He sees everything you're doing. You don't hear that anymore as adults. Do we ever tell our friends, you know God is watching everything you're doing as adults. And when we hear these stories that are not, you know, that are worldly, <laughs> do you do that? And does your wife know you do that? You know, I mean, are you, you know God is watching you? That's what we're told. Everything is recorded. Everything. Don't forget that evil deeds are faithfully recorded and will bring their punishment unless repented of and confessed and washed away by the atoning blood of Christ. It is easier to go in an evil way than to do right. For Satan and his angels are constantly tempting to do wrong. Few realize that it is duty to exercise control over the thoughts and imaginations. You know, um, it's not a sin to be tempted. You know, it's not a sin to have these evil thoughts because you have to question yourself sometimes when the evil thought does, I'm not, trust me, I am not, I don't have a, a defense against evil thoughts. They bombard me all the time. And I ask myself, where did that come from? Is that really you thinking these evil thoughts or these evil thoughts you being tempted with? Right? Now, again, it's, it's not a sin, but to get these evil thoughts and make them your own, and then these evil thoughts, your imagination goes wild. The Diluvian, the antediluvian people, God said, he was going to destroy them. Do you know why? Because their imaginations were evil continually. Was he talking about their thoughts? No, it was their imaginations became evil continually. You know, you look at the Dark Ages, and as you, and as you look at history and you see all the tools that uh, the Catholic Church and uh, all those that were per being persecuted, all these tools that they were used to torture the Christians. You want to know what I ask? Who came up with this imagination or idea to do these things? It's, it's amazing, the wickedness of man. Or the wickedness, or wicked thoughts can lead to. Will you not open your heart to receive such a Savior and praise Him with soul and voice? We offer too little thanksgiving to God. So in this time of thanksgiving, I think we should be grateful for more than just a great meal. We need to consider the words of Christ. Without me, you can do nothing. And wherever you are and whatever you are doing, look continually to Jesus and let the love of God dwell in you richly as you cooperate with the Holy Spirit and divine intelligences in representing Jesus Christ. We know this, right? We should know this by heart. The Lord cried, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred and tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, to fear God and what? Give glory to Him. How do we glorify God? With everything that you do, with everything you think of, with all your thoughts, with all your thoughts, with all your mind, heart, and soul. What is the soul? It's your body, it's your whole being. With whatever work you do, whatever it is you set to do that day, give glory to Him. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The heart is the source of all our words and actions. Christ's character should be 
our character. Then our words will be like Christ's character. So what does an impure thoughts lead to? Impure actions. Pure water must come from where? Simple, in order to get pure water, you got to get it from pure river or pure spring, right? Sowing and reaping, very quickly. What happens? When you sow a thought, you reap an action. When you sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. Sow a character, what do you reap? A destiny. What is the fundamental seed? Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And we read in Galatians, For he that soweth to his flesh shall, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So the privacy of the mind determines what we really are. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So who has your heart? And with whom are our thoughts? Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image and breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. So evaluation is an Adventist. We keep the Sabbath, right? We do not eat unclean foods. We dress with reform in mind. We have the true gospel we preach. Therefore, we must be God's elect, right? Right? But who are we comparing ourselves with? Do you look at the next guy at work, oh, I'm better than him? Or do you look at the brother at church, oh, I'm better than him? Or do you look at the guy who's preaching, I'm better than him? Or do we compare ourselves with the character of Christ? That's the key. See, Christ gave us a gift. He gave us a gift of enmity, which is to hate sin. And then Father, the Father gave us a gift of the Son. And then Jesus went back up to heaven after dying in, in, in our behalf for our sins. And he said, I'm going to ask the Father to give you my spirit, but it shall come from him. He gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is whose character? Christ. It's the Father's character. But Christ revealed his Father's character here on earth. Therefore, we are reflecting Christ's character which is the same as the Father's. We may not be what we think we are. I don't recommend this, but if you ever ask anybody, what do you think of me? What faults do you see in me? You might, you might learn a thing or two. But the truth is, what you think, that's what you are. How you think, that's what you are. You know, we have a saying in Spanish, you know, or in English, you know, this person's always, you know, saying this about this person, you know, or, or accusing this person of doing this wrong. And when you're accusing somebody, more than likely, it's that's what you're doing wrong. You know? Try to always see the good in people. Always try to see the good in people. As man thinketh again in his heart, so is he. An evil thought leaves an evil impress on the mind. If the thoughts are pure and holy, the man is better for having cherished them. By them, the spirit pulse is quickened and the power for doing good is increased. And as one drop of rain prepares the way for another in the moistening of the earth, so one good thought prepares the way for another. It has been truly said, show me your company and I will show you your character. 
We fail to realize how sensibly both character and reputation are affected by their choice of associates. And it's true. You know we as fathers, you know we as parents, we always watch who our children are hanging around with. And we notice these traits that we don't want our children to pick up. Because our children will pick up those traits. But are we as adults safe from that? No. One seeks the company of those who taste and habits are and practices are congenial, right? But he who professes society of the ignorant and, and vicious to that of the wise and good shows that his own character is defective. His tastes and habits may at first be altogether dissimilar to the tastes and habits of those whose companies he seeks, but as he mingles with his class, his thoughts and feelings, they will change. He sacrificed right principles and intensively, yet unavoidably, sinks to the level of his companions. As a stream always partakes of the property of the soil through which it runs, so the principles and habits of youth invariably become tinctured with the character of the company which they mingle. So children, when your parents say, I don't want you to go to this person's or I don't want you to hang out, it's not because we as parents are mean. It's because we know just a little bit more than you, children. Just a little bit. And when my wife tells me I can't do this or I can't do that because she sees something that I can't see. So my wife knows a little bit more than me. <laughs> and husbands the same to the wives. You know? And there's many a time that I've thanked my wife. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful I listened to you. Because it was against everything I thought and everything I felt to go against you. Because it was what I wanted. I want to read these last two slides for you. These are my last two slides. At the very beginning of his first letter, the, the, uh, the aged servant of God ascribed to his Lord a tribute of praise and thanksgiving. And if you can get anything out of this study this morning for this season of thanksgiving is this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He exclaimed, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. Did you read that? This is the gift. He has given us the ability to be like Christ. All we gotta do is ask for his spirit to be in us so that his spirit in us can change the way we think the way we speak, the way we see things. And undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this hope of a sure inheritance in the earth made new, the early Christian rejoiced, even in times of severe trial and affliction. Affliction. Ye greatly rejoice, Peter wrote, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold of temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold perishes. Though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. Let me read that again that it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love. God's people said, Amen. Amen. In whom, though now you see him not, ye rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. My friend, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. Whether we die and be resurrected or we may be alive at a second coming, He is coming. And what matters from this point now until His coming or from now until we see, meet death and sleep is what you think, how you speak, how you treat others, and who you represent. 
Do you represent the world? Or do you represent Christ? That's it. I'll close with this. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit, which is the character of Christ, to them that ask Him? Do you think that God, if you ever ask God, Lord, take this away from me, that this is the way I feel, this way I think, this sin that I'm doing, or this or that, that He will not take it from you if you truly, really ask Him to, and He will give you something in return for it? He doesn't just take something from you and leaves you void of that bad habit. He's willing to give you something in return. And that is His Spirit. Amen? So in this season, let's be thankful that we have a sure calling, and that calling is to be just like Jesus. So with that, let's close with the hymn, and we'll close with hymn number 90. Hymn 90. Very good choice. <laughs> Now thank we all our God. You know, in this time of season, we will be with many families. Hopefully, mostly everyone will have somewhere to go. And it's said that in, in, in Thanksgiving, there's always someone who we have a problem with or, or there's always um, dissension in the family. I think it would be good that this year, if, if there's any of that in your hearts, give it to Christ, you know? And let's be thankful that... Uh, we still have breath in us that we can forgive and ask for forgiveness. Amen? Amen? So remember that when you see your family and your friends. Let's bow our head. Dear Father, we thank you again, O Lord, for the gift of thy Son, Jesus Christ. And we have so much to be thankful for this season, Lord. We pray now, Lord, that we will ask you more and more to be like Jesus, that we can have his spirit. And this we ask it in his name. Amen.